smartest film critic in the world, Cole Smithy. Hi, this is Cole Smithy with ColeSmithy.com and your guide to what to see and what to avoid at the movies this week. You couldn't pick two more entertaining companions for a cinematic road trip in Italy than Steve Coogan and Rob Brydon. Oh, hey. Listen, the observer wants us to do more restaurant reviews. Really? But this time in Italy. And they'll fly you to Europe. The first class. Following on the success of the trip made in 2010, in which the duo went on a comic car tour of northern England to sample its gastronomical delights, the trip to Italy improves, however, slightly on the first film's casual design. Writer-director Michael Winterbottom returns to manage the shenanigans that Coogan and Bryden get up to while purportedly writing culinary articles for The Observer. Having rented a Mini Cooper, a reference to Peter Collinson's original film version of The Italian Job, which featured Michael Caine in its leading role, our free associating duo sets out on a scenic tour of Italy mapped by locations where the poets Percy Shelley and Lord Byron left their marks. Poetry of language is always on Coogan's and Bryden's minds, although more so on Bryden's agenda. The duo's itinerary takes them from northern Piemonte down to the Amalfi Coast with plenty of stops at distinguished restaurants along the way. A stream of devilish details haunts the film's waggish tone. Coogan has taken the liberty of disconnecting the car's iPod jack to avoid listening to Bryden's objectionable taste in music. Still, Bryden has a trick up his sleeve. He has with him one CD, Alanis Morissette's Jagged Little Pill album from 1995. You're meant to get as close to each other as you can. I know, you have to spoon. Spooning, yeah. I know. Yeah. And we on each other as well, and that's, well, that's allowed. Where, well, that's where recreation meets survival. Two skilled British actors singing along in a Mini Cooper to Alanis Morissette is as funny as it sounds, which is to say pretty damned amusing. Watching Steve Coogan and Rob Brydon doing dueling impersonations of Michael Caine is a pure, simple pleasure that must be experienced. Where the first film was content to pepper lightly with just a few impersonation duels, this movie lets Coogan and Brydon go at it full tilt in fancy restaurants where neither fellow patrons nor staff seem to mind the outbursts. Naturally, the actor's contest turns to Kane's performances as Batman's butler. When the pair slip into an improv sketch involving an assistant director charged with telling Christian Bale and Tom Hardy not to mumble, the humor meter goes into the red. Bryden's knee-jerk habit of slipping into frequent spasms of Al Pacino impressions also never gets old. For what is clearly a carefully thought-out script, the trip to Italy has a remarkable naturalness to it. Lush Italian locations celebrated in films such as Ingrid Bergman's Voyage to Italy, Humphrey Bogart's Beat the Devil, and Jean-Luc Godard's Contempt come into play with a sense of appreciation for cinema history. Still, nothing is above making a joke about. Rob Bryden's hysterical conversation with a lava-covered victim of the Pompeii volcano kept in a glass coffin dances on comic principles celebrated by the likes of Monty Python. You've got a quiet taste. I don't think you can chop it really with anything. Yeah. Some brown sauce. That's true. Everywhere you look, history keeps rearing its inevitable head for Coogan or Bryden to tickle when they aren't feasting on Italian food and wine. This is a vacation you'll want to take more than once. I give this hilarious comedy an A-. My sleeper pick is Michael Walker's The Maid's Room, and my guilty pleasure pick is Philippe Garel's Jealousy. My must-have DVDs are Tie Me Up, Tie Me Down from the Criterion Collection, The Saint Set One from Acorn, and Aerial America Southwest Collection from Smithsonian Channel. Wikipedia lists Meet John Doe as an American comedy film. How wrong they are. 
Frank Capra's trenchant 1941 social satire of right-wing manipulation of American society came just before America's involvement in World War II at a time when the country's anxious social climate was exacerbated by stiff economic circumstances following the Great Depression. The script is based on a story by war photographer and newspaper journalist Robert Purnell Sr. Although the doors closed on the group theater's socially conscious plays during the same year, the theater company's influence for creating forceful, socially provocative works is clearly on display in Meet John Doe. The film still retains its resonance as a lively commentary against political and corporate corruption in a capitalist system that is nothing more than another form of fascism. In hindsight, aspects of Spartacus and Ace in the Hole seem derived from John Doe's socially driven plot. The film is a singular example of mainstream leftist cinema at its best. Times are tough. Newspaper writer Ann Mitchell, played by Barbara Stanwyck, is one of many staff members getting the axe. A single mother of two, Ann pleads for her job before sitting down to write her final column, one she intends to provoke the kind of fireworks her editor is looking for to boost newspaper sales. Ann writes an editorial letter under the non diplom John Doe, protesting society's corrupt methods that exploit American citizens from cradle to grave. Ann's John Doe promises to commit suicide on Christmas Eve by jumping from the top of the city Hall Tower as his final act of protest against an impossible system that enslaves its populace. Anne's phony letter strikes a nerve with the masses. To ensure her continued employment, she hatches a plan for the paper to hire a common man to accept responsibility for writing the letter, namely a real-life John Doe. Fifty dollars is all it takes. With his movie star jawline, Gary Cooper underplays the downtrodden character of John Willoughby, a former minor league baseball pitcher in need of elbow surgery before he can return to his chosen profession. For the last few years, John has ridden the rails with his harmonica playing hobo companion, the Colonel, played by Walter Brennan. Although a supporting character, the Colonel is a key figure because he speaks the author's theme lines regarding the true nature of freedom. He sees through the insidious rat race that money demands of its servants and refuses to participate. He's an outlier with reason and a purpose. You'd be hard-pressed to find such an ideally composed socialist character in any other film. And this is coming from Frank Capra, the man who made It's a Wonderful Life and produced U.S. military propaganda movies. Go get him, cowboy. Newspaper publisher and right-wing political upstart D.B. Norton, played by Edward Arnold, plays two ends against the middle by funding the formation of hundreds of John Doe clubs across the country. Norton's underhanded but obvious intent is to repurpose the club's members as voters who will pave his way to the White House. Providing John Doe club members with the utopia they demand is the opposite of what Norton intends to deliver. Barbara Stanwyck's unreliable character, Anne, is revealed to be a canny opportunist with a bag of self-serving, read, survivalist tricks. Fainting works when sobbing doesn't do the job. I've been lonely and hungry for something practically all my life. Meet John Doe ends on an uncertain note. John Willoughby is left just as confused as he was when he first walked in to audition for the role of working class hero. Nothing has changed except John Willoughby is called something different. Thanks for watching. Visit ColeSmithy.com for more.